good morning, everyone. Let's go ahead and uh, stand as we worship the Lord. pray together. Father God, we thank you for this day that you have given us. Lord, we thank you for bringing us together into your house to praise your name, to worship you in spirit and in truth. So Lord, as we sing and read, as we listen, as we give, as we engage in worship together here today, I pray, Lord, that we would be blessed by the experience and God, that we would bless your name as we do so. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. You may be seated just for a moment. Good to see everyone today. So glad that you are here. Welcome to South Garland Baptist Church. If you are a guest with us this morning, then in the rack right in front of you, there's a gold card. I would ask that you would just fill that out and drop it in the offering plate when that goes by. That just gives us a record of your visit and a way for me to get in contact with you later this week. Thank you so much for doing that. Everybody, this is uh, the last week of our fundraiser that we're doing right now for our students for youth camp. Um, they have been busy over the course of this month, and there's still a few more jobs to do in this Hire a Student fundraiser. And so if you've got a job that you would like a student to take part in and you want to pay that student to help um, contribute to their youth camp account, this is your last chance. Um, we've already got a little bit of a backup of a few jobs that still need to be done. Um, and so today's the last day I'm going to talk about that. Uh, so if you want that done, then please either see me or see one of our students and enlist them for that task. So grateful to everybody for your generosity over the course of this, this fundraiser and to our students for the work that they've been doing over these last few weeks. Like I said, we've got a few that are going to be working this afternoon, a few that are going to be working later this week, so there's still jobs to be done. Uh, but if you want to add one more to the list, then today is your last opportunity to do that. Um, I think that's all I've got announcement-wise that needs to get covered right here this morning. And so let's take a moment now to greet and welcome one another. Stand to your feet, shake some hands, hug some necks. the kids to come forward and we've got a message just for y'all this morning.
good morning. Oh, you'll have lots of energy. Do you have, what, what did Jesus leave behind for us? Whenever he, whenever he went back to heaven, what did he leave behind for us? The Holy Spirit. That must be the energy that you'll have right now. Is that right? Maybe. Okay, guess what? Did you know that we are all family here? Y'all do? Look at all these people out here. Do y'all know, do you see all these grown-ups out here? Those are our family. And you know what? That, well, I was a little older than y'all, but you know what? They've been my family for a really long time. So they helped me when I was a little kid, and now I'm a grown-up and I made it. So I think y'all are going to make it too. Hey, buddy. So you know what we're going to talk about? So if they're, if we're all family, and look, some of them were my teachers when I was here in Sunday school, and they helped teach me about what do we, what do we learn about here? Bible. Well, the Bible and God and how to treat others and how to treat our neighbors. And so guess what? They taught me those things, and now I'm helping to teach you all those things. So is that going to be y'all's job someday? Okay, well, it's going to be your job. Have y'all ever heard of a guy in the Bible? Do y'all remember hearing a man named Abraham? Yes. Yes. Well, you know what? He had a big family in the end. A big family, and we are all kind of a part of that family. But here's, here's what I want you to listen. Just like, we're, oh, just, like, just like he had a big family, whenever you are someone who knows God, do you know God, who God is? In the, who you are? Well, when you know God, then you become a part of this family. You become a part of that family of believers. And so our job is to share that with others. How are you going to share that with others? How are you going to share God with others? You can just tell them. Okay. Abraham's prayer. Can you back up a little bit? Do you want to be able to see? Once upon a moonless night, when all the stars were shining bright, an old, old man knelt down to pray, and this is what he had to say. How I long to have a boy. It would give me so much joy. Yeah, look right here then. God was quick with his reply. Go outside and scan the sky. Try to count each little star that is twinkling from afar. If you can, then you will know how big your family will grow. Can y'all count all the stars? No. Oh my goodness, some of them are so little, aren't they? So far? Okay, well, look, many years went passing by, and Abraham would often sigh when he saw the starry sky. Yet each time he climbed in bed, he remembered what God said. Yeah, he's counting stars. Then one day God sent some men just to tell him once again God is sending you a boy who will fill your heart with joy. joy. Was he yeah, she's tall. Sarah laughed inside the tent. Is that really what God meant? I'm too old to have a boy. I will never have that joy. Do you see her right here? She yeah. looks, she, she's like a grandma. Yeah. So remember that this is a miracle? Yes. A miracle of what's going to happen? Oh, what happened? But God's promises are true. What he says he's going to do. So when nine more months were done, Sarah had a baby son. How they laughed with pride and joy as they held their little boy. He's an old so baby. cute. Is he an old baby? He's not yeah, an old baby. They are, no, they are old. They are old people, Abraham and Sarah, and they had a baby. And he has gray hair. He does. 
I think he just kind of has one here. That's just the illustration. Yay! He's just a baby, but they never thought they were going to have a baby. So what if your grandma told you she was going to have a baby? Oh, man. Do you think that if grandma told grandpa I'm having a baby that he would really believe her? He'd be like, oh, you're, you're teasing. So that is how Abraham and Sarah felt. But you know what they said? That, that God's promises are true. And if God said that you're going to have a baby boy, no matter if you're 100 or 300 years old, if he said that, that's right, 3,000, it's going to happen. And that was someone that he was adding to our family of believers. All right, y'all, show me how to pray. That's not how you pray. Show me how to pray. So when we pray together, remember when we pray together that our numbers of prayer, that is more power. And that is how we're also going to bring more people to our family. Do y'all want more people to join our family here? I do. And you know what? Not just because we want more friends, because... Our job here is to bring others to God and also so that we can have friends that are like us. All right, ready? We're going to pray. One, two, three, bow your heads, close your eyes. Thank you, Lord, so much for this day. Thank you for this family. Thank you for these awesome kids, and, and thank you for this wonderful family that has, that has been here, and we have rolled through the generations of creating leaders for the next group of children, and so, Lord, I'm just so grateful for that, that special, that special love that is in this church, and so help us to share that love with others in this community, and to let them feel that, that welcoming comfort and love here in your house, Lord. Help us to be like Jesus in everything we do, and everything we say. Amen. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that 
which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his suffering, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attain, attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. You guys go ahead and be seated for this song here.
As we gather to give, I just want to direct y'all to the, the ministry highlight of the week. Um, and it's, well, I was up here a few weeks ago on, on, on the same subject. Uh, and as we pray, I just want to, I want to thank the church, uh, the ministry highlight, if you haven't already made it to it. Um, it's about uh, Brother Nick Whitaker, who's, who's uh, serving the Lord abroad, um, sharing the message uh, about Jesus. And I just want to thank this church uh, for for the faithfulness y'all have had um, and and sharing of your your gifts and your tithes and offerings. And as I pray for the offering today, I would just ask that y'all remember Nick, um, and, and I know that y'all do. But I just ask while I pray to uh, to thank the Lord for the ability to give and and bless this offering that you guys think of Nick. Um, pray with me. Father God, we are so very grateful to be able to be in this house and worship together as, as a church family. Lord, we're just grateful um, for this, this wonderful facility that you've given us, uh, Lord, and, and, and all these the wonderful things that we've had time to grow up and be together and do and, and serve you. Uh, Lord, in this time of giving, I just ask that you, uh, you bless the giver. 
uh, Lord, and you bless the offering that we're able to use that uh, to continually continue to faithfully serve you on this corner, uh, in this city, uh, in this state, and in this country and throughout the world. Lord, we just uh, we thank you again for your faithfulness, Lord, and for your son Jesus. And it is in his name that I pray. Amen. good it is to be blessed by beautiful music each and every Sunday as part of our worship. Thankful for those who have led us here this morning as we've sung and as we've worshiped here together. Back in 1943, 1943, the psychologist Abraham Maslow published a paper entitled A Theory of Human Motivation in the academic journal psychological review. Dr. Maslow theorized in that paper that there are certain universal human needs which drive behavior, that every single one of us is driven by these particular needs, that it spans no matter what your background, no matter where you come from or who you are, that these universal human needs are what, in a large part, determine how you will behave. And what's more, he said that these different needs can, in fact, be ranked from most important to least important. This ranking became known as Maslow's hierarchy of needs. He said that at the bottom of this pyramid kind of structure— that the most important element of the hierarchy, the base, if you will, is the physiological needs. Every human being 
needs food and water and shelter merely to survive. And so Maslow said that if you don't have these needs met, then, well, nothing else particularly matters. Above that, he said there's a need for safety, a need to feel secure and, in fact, to be secure in your environment at both a physical level as well as an emotional, mental, spiritual level. Above that, once those needs are met, he said we all have a human innate need for for love and belonging. That no man is an island, that no person makes it through life by themselves. And so another need that we have is for friends and for family, for a community to come around us. Once that need is met, he said we all have a need for esteem. Everybody likes to be noticed every now and then. We all want to be judged favorably by our family, by our friends, by our peers. And just as none of us lives life alone, so too none of us wants to live life in the shadows. So we have that need for esteem. And then finally at the top of this hierarchy of this pyramid structure is the need for self-actualization. The need to have a purpose in life, to have meaning in life, and to move towards that purpose, to fulfill that meaning. Physiological needs, safety needs, love and belonging needs, esteem needs, self-actualization needs. This hierarchy, you understand, is not flawless. In fact, some of Maslow's own psychologist peers have pointed out the fact that it's not based on observable data, it's simply a theory, that it, it generalizes, that it's, it stereotypes human beings, and furthermore, that this structure of a hierarchy creates the idea that you simply climb from one step to the next, when in fact there's often overlap between these different categories. But nevertheless, it remains a useful tool because at its heart lies a fundamental truth. The fundamental truth that the believer and the unbeliever alike can agree upon. That as human beings, we operate based on need. That we move, that we act based upon need. And the only question is where you will go to meet that need. So in pursuit of an answer to that question, where we ought to go to meet our most fundamental needs, I want to invite you to turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. Landon read this passage for us just a few minutes ago. Philippians chapter 3 verses 7 through 14 this morning. There's a Bible in the rack in front of you if you don't have your own. Philippians 3, 7 through 14. We're in this series right now, this this post-Easter series on what the resurrection of Jesus means for believers today. On, On what new life in Christ looks like. And so this morning, what we're going to talk about is where our most fundamental needs are met in the old life, where we go as unbelievers to meet our needs, and then about how laying all that down is actually what leads to true satisfaction. Where we once went to see our needs met, and where in Christ we go to see those needs met. So the author of this passage this morning, Philippians 3, 7 through 14, The author of the passage is known to you as the Apostle Paul. That's what we call him, the Apostle Paul. But before he ever was known in that way, before he was ever called by Jesus and made an apostle, before he became the apostle to the Gentiles and began to favor his Greek name of Paul instead of his Hebrew name of Saul, Before he was the great Apostle Paul, capital A, capital P, he was simply Saul of Tarsus. And verses 5 and 6 that come right before our passage this morning give us the beginnings of kind of an autobiographical picture 
of Saul of Tarsus. Let me read you those verses here now. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I was a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. And as to righteousness under the law, blameless. In Galatians 1.14, he expounds upon this a little bit, saying that I advanced in Judaism beyond many among my people of the same age. For I was more zealous for the traditions of my ancestors than they were. By the early days of the church, we know that he was in fact a leading light among the Pharisees. That when the early disciple and the early deacon Stephen was stoned for his faith, stoned to death, Saul was there. As he says here, as to zeal, I was above all others. As to zeal, I was a persecutor of the church. Saul was there when Stephen was stoned, looking favorably upon the proceedings. So if we break down Saul's life pre-Jesus, we have a pretty good idea of where it is that Saul went to see his needs met based on just this little bit that we're given here. If you want to use Maslow's hierarchy here, we we can do that. Physiological and safety needs don't seem to have ever been a concern for Saul of Tarsus. Now, for the Apostle Paul, they certainly would be. But for Saul of Tarsus, he seems to have been set up pretty well in the early goings-ons. As for love and belonging, where did Saul go to find love and belonging? Well, we know from his letters later that he was unmarried. We don't know about his father or mother, brothers and sisters. But we know that he found love and belonging in his nation, in his tribe, in his religious order. That's why he goes on to, he points out here in verses 5 and 6 of Philippians 3 that he was circumcised on the eighth day, that he's part of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, that he is a Pharisee. This is where his identity was found. This is where his sense of love and belonging was were found in his nation, in his tribe, in his religious order. Well, where did he go to see his need for esteem met? Well, he told us that he advanced in Judaism beyond most, that his zeal and his blamelessness or his righteousness were were unquestioned. So it was by his piety that his esteem was found. And as for his self-actualization, his purpose, his meaning, it was found in his devotion to the law. No one was as devoted to understanding and obeying the law as Saul of Tarsus. And so it seems like he had all of his needs met, taken care of. And yet, in verses 7 and 8... Here's what the Apostle Paul has to say about his old life. Whatever gains I had, these I've come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. See, he was confronted by Jesus on the road to Damascus, on his way to continue the persecution of the early Christians. And it was there that he was given a new perspective. He was confronted by the Lord himself, blinded by a flash of light and heard the voice of Jesus saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And in this moment, at this meeting, he was given a new perspective on who he'd been before on the things he'd valued most before. To where now, he says, it's all rubbish. It's all garbage. It's all worthless. All the things that Saul had been prizing and valuing and putting faith in, he now says, were empty. 
Because here's the first thing we need to understand this morning, church family. The world does not have what it takes to meet your fundamental spiritual needs. Let me say that again. The world does not have what it takes to meet your fundamental spiritual needs. As for where we go to meet our needs, I'm reminded of a place that I used to spend a lot of time back when Lindsay and I lived in Waco, about two hours down I-35. There was a little used bookstore there named, named Golden's Books. And if you know me, then you know I love a good used bookstore. And this was the used bookstore of all used bookstores in the sense that if they had an organizational system, if they have an organizational system, I have yet to uncover it. Um, books stacked on the floor, books stacked on the shelves, books hanging from the ceiling, it felt like sometimes. Books everywhere, and very little sense of how you found anything you were looking for. So for a book lover, it was a dream. Because if you wanted to find something, you needed to spend some time there. You needed to browse the shelf. You needed to look up and down the stacks. You needed to really make your way through this place and get a feel for it. It was a great place to waste some time. For any book lover, you could easily pass an hour in Golden's books. But here's the thing. I learned pretty early when I was in college at Baylor that if I wanted to find a specific book, if I needed a textbook, if I needed something for an English class, if I just needed something for, for myself, if I needed to look for a specific book, Golden's was never going to have what I needed. It was a great place for a random find that proved to be a treasure. But the same stacks that were so charming when I went in aimless were incredibly frustrating when I needed something specific. It was a fun place to be, but not a place to find my needs met. And our world is like that. It's a good place and beautiful and enjoyable place. God created it to be so. But in its fallenness, this world does not satisfy. That's why Jesus could say in Matthew 6, 19, not to store up our treasures on earth, not to place our value in earthly possessions and earthly things, because moth and rust destroy, because thieves break in and steal. Because if you place your value in the things of this world, you will quickly find those things to be impermanent, temporary. Earthly satisfaction is fleeting and fragile and fickle. See, from an impossibly early age, we are indoctrinated into a value system, into a way of life, and convinced that our needs will be met if we just win the game that everyone's playing, that if we make enough money, if we have enough friends, if we win enough influence, well, then we'll be happy. Then we'll be fulfilled. Then our needs will be met. But the more you subscribe to this way of being, the emptier you feel. I like the way that the author David Foster Wallace puts it when he said, if you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you'll never have enough. You'll never feel you have enough. Worship your body and beauty and sexual allure, and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally grieve you. Worship power you will end up feeling weak and afraid, and you will need ever more power over others to numb you to your own fear. Worship your intellect being seen as smart, and you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. But the insidious thing about these forms of worship is not that they're evil or sinful, but that they're unconscious. They are default settings. I think there's so much truth in that. 
this way of life is what we are surrounded by. If you pursue happiness based on the things this world has to offer, your soul will never be satisfied because this world does not have what it takes to meet your fundamental spiritual needs. Okay? So where do we go then? Where are our needs needs met then? If you go back to the passage, you get an idea here in verses 8 and 9. Paul says, more than that, I regard everything as lost because of the surpassing value, the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Paul says that he regards his entire old way of being as lost, as inferior, as worthless compared to knowing Jesus. He makes his goal plain there in verse 14. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. When you hear these words, you wonder, what happened to Saul of Tarsus? What happened to that man who had seemingly risen to the top of the heap based upon what the world had to offer. He was a man at the peak of his powers, according to the world, and now he regards all those accomplishments as rubbish. The short answer is he met Jesus. Acts 9 tells us the story. Acts 9 tells us about his conversion experience on the road to Damascus. Tells us about the blinding light, tells us about the voice from heaven, tells us about Saul being converted to the way of Jesus. Here's what doesn't happen that leads Saul of Tarsus to become the Apostle Paul. Here's what's not necessary. Here's what we don't read. We don't read about him taking a comprehensive course on biblical doctrine. We don't read about how he spends three years volunteering to pay his dues in the local church before he participates. We don't read about how he gives the lead gift to the building campaign. We don't read about any of these Markers that are so important to us today. He meets Jesus, and suddenly he's new. He meets Jesus, and he goes from one way of being to a better way of being, to where he can now proclaim that Saul of Tarsus was unfulfilled, that his needs were unmet, It's ironic that having been blinded by Jesus, his eyes are now opened to the reality that your fundamental spiritual needs are all met in Christ Jesus. They are all met in Christ Jesus. I'm old enough to remember, and most of you are as well, a world that my children we'll never know, or at least not for the foreseeable future. A world before Amazon.com. I want you to imagine a scenario for a second. I want you to imagine that you need a few things. You've got a list, and I'm going to give you the list here now. You need a teddy bear. You need a suit jacket. You need a hammer. You need some Pepto-Bismol, and you need a copy of Catcher in the Rye. Okay? Say that again. You need a teddy bear, a suit jacket, some Pepto-Bismol, a hammer, and a copy of the catcher in the rye. Now, there was a time when to get those five things, you would need to go to five different stores. You would need to go to a hardware store, to a toy store, to a pharmacy, to a bookstore, and to a department store to get those five things. Well, over time... Walmart came along, Target came along, and it got a little bit easier. But rest assured, if you wanted those five things and you were to walk into a Walmart or a Target, you are taking your chances that they're going to have everything you need. But for anybody in Gen Z, anybody in Gen Alpha, our young folks, 
Amazon has always been the default option for whatever it is you're buying. I can speak from personal experience that when we need something and we voice the fact that we need that thing, the first thing that my kids ask is, why don't we get it from Amazon? Why? Because they have everything. Everything you need can be found in this one place. And if you're willing to wait two days for shipping, it can be yours with the click of a button. Everything you need in one simple place. If you look to this world to meet your spiritual needs, then you're going to find your soul divided going in a bunch of different places to see your needs met. Because you can't give yourself fully to home and career and friends and community and personal development. You can't do it. You will exhaust yourself trying, and you will disappoint yourself when the world inevitably lets you down. But the gospel truth is that there is a way that is both easier and better Your fundamental spiritual needs are met in Christ. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. And whether you're using Maslow's hierarchy of needs or any other, you will see that he is able. Philippians 4, 9 puts it this way, that my God will fully satisfy every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. If you want to see the emptiness in you filled, if you want to see these needs met, you can do some one-stop shopping here and find your needs met in Christ Jesus. So here is the question this morning. Where are you going to see your needs met? Which way of life are you adopting? Are you finding love and belonging? Are you finding esteem? Are you finding purpose here in this world? Are you running from place to place, source to source, wearing yourself down to a bone, trying to meet these needs according to what the world has to give you? Are you running that rat race, trying to get it all done by yourself? Or have you laid those things down? Have you placed them at the foot of the cross? Have you been crucified with Christ and raised to a new life? Are you finding your purpose in him instead of in this world? Are you looking to him for provision instead of this world? Are you looking to him for security instead of this world? To him for love and belonging instead of this world? Which way of life are you living? That of the world or that of Christ? The old way of being or the new way? Jesus invites you to resurrection life, to a new way of of being. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. Pick it up today. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this day. Father, I thank you for songs that we can sing to proclaim your goodness and your greatness, for words of scripture that we can read, words that convict us, that encourage us, that remind us of your goodness and your grace. And so, Father, as we prepare to sing one of those songs, as we think about the words that we've read and that we've heard, I pray, Lord, that we would take a moment here for self-diagnosis of a sort that we would allow the Spirit to move in this place, that we would listen to his leading. And Father, that we would ask ourselves whether we are stuck in the old way of life or whether we have risen anew in Christ. 
whether our needs are being met by this world or whether we're counting on you to meet them. So, Father, during this time of invitation, as we pray and as we sing, I ask that you would move in our hearts. I ask that you would speak to us through your spirit. And I ask that you would change us. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. We will sing together here in just a second. We'll sing words about laying down those things of the world, placing them at the feet of Jesus and surrendering all to him. We'll sing those words together in a moment. And as we do so, I'll be down here at the front. This morning, if you have a decision to bring before the church, if you want to become a part of this body of believers, or if you want to lay things down for the first time, you want to say, I have been stuck in the old way of life, and I want to be crucified with Christ and raised to new life in him. If you want to give your life to Jesus, I'll be down here at the front to receive you, to welcome you, to pray with you. For the rest of us, I encourage you to pray and to worship as we sing together, I Surrender All. Let's stand together and let's sing. All to Jesus I surrender All to Him I freely give I will ever love and trust Him In His presence daily live I surrender all I surrender all All to Thee Blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender. Humbly at His feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus, take me now. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender. As our word of benediction this morning, I want to read to you the last verse of our passage. The Apostle Paul said, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. May you press on toward that same goal this week. Go in peace. Mm -hmm.